Stacy, thank you for hosting me here at NGA. It's so wonderful to see you after so many years. It is, it's great to see you. Yeah. Welcome to NGA. Thank you so much. It's such a beautiful building and I always enjoy um, making plans to come out here at NGA. So um, you, have, uh, you and I have known each other for almost 15 years now. And I've always admired how your career and the choices you've made um, along the way have like really reflected who you are. Um, I know our listeners here today would really love to hear about your journey and um, how does an engineering PhD like <laughs> you end up at the, in the intelligence community and as a deputy director of NGA? Wow, it's, it's really funny. The only thing that I knew coming out of high school was that I love science and engineering. So the idea that I ended up in engineering, that part's not a surprise. The, I was well on my way to an academic career for uh, up through about 2002, you know, undergrad, grad school, up through postdoc, and then I sort of had a change of, of heart and decided that I didn't want to go directly into um, academia. However, it also collided with the 2002 recession. So uh, industry wasn't hiring, uh, it was really difficult to figure out where to go, and I ended up coming home and ran into some um, family friends, and I'm from D.C., so surrounded by government, surrounded by national security and intelligence, never thought about it whatsoever. Uh -huh. But turns out that I have family friends that are in the community, and I was jokingly asking one day, you know, are, you, are you hiring, because I really needed a job, and they actually were. So that was my first time I got an interview with someone who could tell me very little about what he did, but he made it sound really interesting. So I said, well, why not? And that's sort of how it all started. With respect to getting here into this deputy director seat, that also wasn't really part of the plan. It was just, and I've, I've taken advantage of great opportunities, whether it was working on the Hill, whether it was working in congressional affairs, moving into research, being able to lead a research organization outside under the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. All those things together, I think, helped give me some skill sets that were valuable in partnering me with Admiral Sharp here at NGA at this time. Yeah. Well, at least from my perspective, you're definitely a trailblazer for, for a lot of women, um, especially uh, in the intelligence community. Thank you. And um, I can see for myself in my you know, the last kind of 15 years being part of the intelligence community and then coming out in, in private sector as well, um, I know that um, we see a lot of uh, women now in the intelligence community, but you can probably attest too, it wasn't always that way, especially in senior positions. Um, and there's still a lot of room I think, for women to grow into leadership positions in the intelligence community. What's the biggest change that you've seen in the culture that has um, allowed women mm. to kind of grow into these roles? And what challenges or issues do you still think um, need to be addressed? What's interesting, so 10 years ago when I started, I definitely looked, if I looked at the leadership team there, the directorate heads, the sort of C-suite level type folks, uh, there were not a lot of women, not at the director level. There were some deputies. The agency de director was a woman. Mm -hmm. Below her, there were some additional folks on the staff, but really across the board, you didn't see a lot. And you fast forward to today, and it's really um, more than half of the women, uh, more than half of the leadership positions are held by women mm -hmm. here right now, which is uh, pretty unheard of in 10 years, I think. What's made it possible, and it, I don't know that it was necessarily anyone going out and saying, we need to hire more women, because that's just not really how you do things in government especially, right. but I think we were able to reduce some of the barriers that were keeping women from being successful. So people started being a little more in tune as to the opportunities they were pro providing to their best, their best teammates. They started thinking about the types of things that were um, keeping women from actually ascending to certain positions. And I think by removing those barriers, we've made it easier to realize that there are a lot of people, a lot of talented people in this agency. What's an example of a barrier? Like what, what, what do you I, like whether cultural? It's some, or, whether yeah. it's something like um, uh, a, a conference out of town. Oh, and okay. someone yeah. thinks, oh, well, she's got kids. Uh, I'm, not gonna, okay. I'm not going to bother yeah. her. Right. Right. I'm yeah. not going to bother yeah. her with that. But yeah. that's the conference that then gives them opportunities and helps them meet people. Sure. So perceptions, you make yeah. decisions for someone else, yeah. so things like that. Got it. Right, right. Interesting. So, well, yeah. Oh, in terms of the other part of the question uh -huh. was uh, how much more? Are like what other challenges and issues challenges? do you still see? Yeah. I, you know, it, it, it's, it's fleeting, right? So our organization is actually still um, heavily male. I mean, more than half of our workforce is male. And our recruitment is about the same. And so at any moment, it really could go the other way. Um, you know, I want talent wherever talent is, but I also want to make sure this is a place where everyone can be successful. And, you know, we're human. We all have our biases, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily knowing what those are and not knowing how they might disadvantage someone else is a challenge I think we're going to be facing for a while. It's just, it's human nature right. to want to be surrounded by people that are like you. And when the majority of the workforce is not female, for example, um, it can be harder for women, but I think there's a lot of people here who want um, 
they want to make sure that we're an inclusive environment. They're right, a place right. where anyone can be successful and bring their talents. And so I think that's, that's what's going to make us overcome that. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you are a woman in leadership here at, at NGA, but you're also a minority. You're a, a black woman in leadership. And how has that identity shaped your experience? What do you want other women of color like myself to know um, about your journey? And you know, how, how was it different? And what did you, you know, what, what did you feel that you want other people to know about? It's really interesting. I, I, I've had a chance to kind of think about my journey to this point, and I feel like I've, I've, I, was, I was lucky in many ways in that I was naive about a lot of things in the world. And in this case, it was good. So I didn't really notice when people were not allowing me to do things. Interesting. Or I assumed it wasn't. I never really thought about the fact, oh, it was because I'm a woman or because it's a race. I was like, oh, well, I guess I just didn't get this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I've become a lot more aware of these things and what more people face and, and, and being aware of it, I think, brings challenges because then you know you're sort of always fighting against it. I sort of lived in a little bit of a, a, of a, a happy bubble for a while. However, the thing that actually did, did stand out at that time was I worked for a lot of women. And it just so happened that probably more than half of my bosses throughout all of my career have been women who have been very supportive of their entire workforce. Mm -hmm. So to me, it wasn't strange to look up and see the next level up or even the, 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 the leader of our particular organization was female. So I could aspire to something like that. You know, I had role models. I had people in my career who I was like, oh, women can do anything. And I know that's not the same for everybody that's out there. So I have to be mindful of that and still continue to encourage people who may not have as supportive bosses or may not have as supportive of colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I forgot the rest of your question already. <laughs> oh. So uh, you were talking about, um, is there something that, I, I was asking like, is there something you wish oh, someone had message. told you? Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, I think looking back and the thing that I tell people now that I didn't do very well, it's all about the networking and the relationships. Uh, you know, I always hear everyone says, oh, you've got a network, you've got a network. And I didn't know why or what that was and why it was so important. It really is those relationships that you develop mm -hmm. because as everyone increases in their careers, everyone sort of develops and takes on new positions, you find yourself at a, um, in a particular role where those colleagues that you developed along the way who've gone on different paths are now in roles where you can have partners and allies, right. whether this right. is other places in government or mm -hmm. whether other places in industry. So having that kind of network and cultivating it early from the beginning is really critical. And I would do things differently than I did in the beginning now that I understand the importance of that. Um, the other thing that I would tell people of color in general and women of color, you have allies that look like everything, different genders, different um, ethnicities, backgrounds, races. The more diverse your circle of colleagues, your circle of friends, I think the more not only rich your life is, but the better off you'll be able to be a leader of all types of people sure. when you get that opportunity. Yeah. And I think that is something that can help people stand out, the ability for everyone to feel welcome and part of the team. Good. So something you said a little bit ago um, mm -hmm. kind of struck a chord with me. There's this perception or maybe misconception about how women don't support women yeah. in the workforce. But you're talking about leaders that you had and people that you worked for, women that you worked for, that really went out of their way to, to help you. Right. So, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I've heard that as well in some cases. And I think especially when there weren't many opportunities that were being made available to women, that competition was a lot worse. I think yeah, now because sense, there are yeah. more opportunities that, at least in my experience, it hasn't been that way. I've, I've worked with a lot of women who wanted to help me succeed, saw potential in me and helped to bring that out. And while it's not the case with everyone and everywhere, we really should be encouraging each other. Uh, you know, any talent that's not leveraged to its fullest is bad for whether it's government or industry. And so uh, we, we have to get past whatever that competition is and really figure out how to be back more in the collaborative space. Mm -hmm. So I hope I hope it's a changing thing that yeah. there aren't many places where women right. are not supporting each other. Yeah. And I've been very fortunate as well to have uh, women, either colleagues or, or bosses that have been um, there to, to support me and to help me and guide me. So um, so you, your, you, your experience and mine are, are similar. Good. Um, so shifting a little bit on, on the cybersecurity yes. question. Um, do you think that our government specifically and uh, the IC in particular has invested in cybersecurity where it needs to be at the levels that they should be? You know, it's interesting. I, I, there are models out there that, that government shares. It's the same models that industry uses in terms of figuring out what the investment should be. So I feel like we have done our, our you know, as well as we can to make sure that we're investing at that level. Um, you all, you remember when we were on the Hill together, that was sort of the first time the cybersecurity initiative right, came into being. Right. And I just remember thinking, new, that's yeah. a lot of money <laughs> to apply to something that we will never actually get to the end, right? 
Cybersecurity is, is an ongoing investment. It's something that we're going to have to spend a lot of money on just because the, the, the threats keep changing, the, the different tools, the techniques, the malware, whatever it is that keeps changing. People adapt every time we come up with a better defense. So it's a little hard to say whether the, the monetary value is the right one, but I believe that we are you know, doing as well as we can given that you know, budgets aren't increasing for everything. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yes, on that respect. The place where I think that I'm a little worried though is with the workforce. So uh, there's just not enough people with those skill sets in the country, and especially when you have a more limited mission where you're limited to uh, American citizens, there's just not enough people with the skill sets to be able to fill all of the cybersecurity jobs. Mm -hmm. So while the investment might be the right thing, um, having enough people in there to do the work, that's going to be a challenge until we figure out how to get more of our young folks to go into STEM careers. Uh, so that's something that I think about, you know, separately from, you know, the work at NGA, but I think about that a lot. Right, and then that, now there's so much emerging technologies that will be competing with cybersecurity. So for example, quantum and AIML, 5G, things like that. So um, as a leader here at NGA, how do you make sure that the resources that you've identified or needed for a specific issue, such as cybersecurity of NGA's assets, how do we make sure that that doesn't get shifted to another priority? You, you, you have to, you do your best to hold firm with whatever the plan is and to resource the plan uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm happy though that some of the conversations about cybersecurity have moved into sort of outcome space as opposed to level of investment based. Oh, so that are, are you achieving the outcome that you, that, you're, that you stated that you want to achieve? Are you able to do your mission in a way safely and securely are probably the things that we should be measuring. So the money, the monetary value could change, but if the outcome remains the same, we're good. With respect to the other emerging technologies, you are correct. There is always that, that lure to be have to throw money at a different technology because it is the, the, threat, the threat of the day. Uh, but when you've got so many different things changing at the same time, it can be very difficult. What I found in those particular ones is that they're very related. Uh, you know, you can use, you can use AI ML in, in, your, um, uh, in the way that you pursue cybersecurity. And that's a way that kind of increased not only the cybersecurity, but also your knowledge of the AI ML. Quantum with, the, with the, the cryptology and being able to break that or protect it, you know, again, it's sort of a similar thing. So making investments in these other areas is, does continue to still uh, benefit the cybersecurity mission. So I guess I find that, that even though there are a lot of competing sure. ones, that there is a lot of uh, interrelation between them. So mm -hmm. um, as long as we're investing in a little in each of them, they're all going to kind of benefit each other. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners today? That, um, I am just that excited to have been a part of this summit. Great, I think it's yeah. a great conversation to be having. I think it's really important to be uh, challenging ourselves to make sure that we're doing enough to protect the country, and protect uh, our, our way of life, protect our democracy. And certainly there are other countries out there that want to steal um, intellectual property, steal ideas, steal right. uh, data and information, and um, knowing that there are organizations like Billington, knowing that there are partners like AWS who are helping us to be as secure as we can be, just I'm very happy about that. So on behalf of NGA, thank you for having us here today. Well, thank you for your time and for being so candid with your experience, and I know that a lot of people will be really excited to hear about how you've you know gone through this journey and um, will learn from your experiences as well. So I hope so. It's thank great you, to see you again. Good to see you. You too. Thank you.